along with new designs by Leon Boxt and Alexandre Benoit. Commissioned initially in 2018 by Christiana Axelson for students at the Bainbridge Dance Center on Bainbridge Island, my new version reimagined for an all-male cast for the Joyce Theater's Pride Festival intentionally upends the original ballet's benchmark as the first non-narrative ballet blanc with a hint of present-day narrative. In my version, the young poet, clad in garments inspired by contemporary men's fashion, is intercepted by and inducted into what I imagine to be a tribe of fairies in the contemporary sense of the term, inspired by the radical fairies, who have spent so much time in the wild away from human society that they have begun to evolve insect-like attributes, a nod to the curious conception popularized in the Victorian era that fairies were diminutive flying humanoids with insect wings. So I'll just pull up. I don't have much from Les Feed because I really just began working on it. So I will share my screen and just try to show a few design images basically. Okay, so this is Nijinsky and Tamara Karsabina in the original production. And this is a drawing by Andrew Jordan of one of my sylphs, the insect-like fairies. And this shows a little bit more of the design. Um, so importantly, in addition to their interspecies queering via fantastical theri-anthropic hybridization, the sylphs in my version of the ballet champion and stand for countless LGBTQIA plus individuals who have had the courage to reject the constraints of societal norms in favor of more inclusive communal lifestyles in harmony with the natural world. Now, um, I, I have uh, some rehearsal footage to show because we were just basically beginning in every way. I had just taught the dancers the steps, but uh, I'll show you here um, the video I have, first one is of Taylor Stanley and uh, Davide Ricard Ricardo um, just dancing a little bit of material for the first section, which is the prelude. We're not seeing. Christopher, we can't the see image. that. Can you uh, reshare your screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop the share and I'm yeah. going to try again here. Yeah. Okay, are you seeing the video now? Yes, good. Great. Thank Sorry you. about that, everybody. That's all right.
And the dancers would absolutely kill me if they knew that I was sharing this rehearsal footage. <laughs> this was never meant to be seen by the general public. Um, this section is uh, part of the nocturne and just gives you a sense of what, you know, some group activity activity would be. Again, I think yeah, again. Oh, sorry. I see what's happening. Um, I have to select the actual uh, video I'm sharing as opposed to the general screen. It won't. It won't be seamless, of course. Okay, there it is. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And then during that little section, when Taylor goes down in the foreground, this is what's happening there. Share my screen. just uh i'll do one more little uh section from that piece it's we were rehearsing at the um 
BAC, Bethany Arts Community, in a residency there. Um, and this is from the second waltz. Okay. And this shows a little bit of what those, uh, you know, wing-like skirts, these are just rehearsal skirts that are meant to give the impression of what the wing-like skirts would be once they're fully designed. So I'll move on to Narcissus now. Um, found only in fragmentary form in a handful of ancient Greek sources, the more than 2,000 year old Narcissus myth we have come to know in which a beautiful ill-fated youth rejects all suitors and falls fatally in love with his own image became widespread via book three of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Popularized since then in countless works of art of many genres including painting, sculpture, poetry, drama, dance, photography, and film, notably James Bidgood's 1971 Pink Narcissus, a glorious art house paean to the fantasies of a gay male prostitute. The myth's protagonist even lent his name to the psychoanalytical term narcissism. When I first heard Nikolai Chernin's score, Narcisse Echo, composed in 1912 for the Ballet Russe, I had already been drawn to its mythic scenario's indelible mark on Western culture and was interested in reappropriating its themes to reimagine the original ballet through my own contemporary queer lens. Commissioned by New York Live Arts for a world premiere this year now postponed, my Narcissus, like many of my former works, is conceived on stage as a complete work of art comprised of choreographic, musical, and visual design components further exploring traditions begun with the Wagnerian concept of Gesamtkunstwerk and sustained by the Ballet Russe. I will show you some images now from that piece. Oops, that's not it. Narcissus, here we go. So this is, Narci this is Nijinsky in, in the original role of Narcissus. This is my reflection of Narcissus, design drawing for that costume by Andrew Jordan. And this is Taylor Stanley as Narcissus. So the costumes kind of uh, reflect one another in the color schemes. These are designs for the Oreads. These are some Oreads from the piece, more Oreads. And more Oreads. <laughs> I've worked a lot with them. So this is the design for Echo, who is an inter intersex character. And Narcissus and the Oreads, the, his reflection. You know, I didn't have an opportunity to work with Taylor yet. Um, these are the Bacantes. These are two of the Boeotians. More Boeotians. And more Boeotians. And this is uh, uh, by Matisse, but it reflects the set. Let me um, continue my idea here. I'll go back though. Like, I like this image. <laughs> so um, in contrast to Leon Bach's maximal historical set and costume designs for the original ballet, the sets and costumes for my version will evoke, evoke an anachronistic dreamscape of a certain visual graphicness and economy. 
Prosthetic costume pieces include zoomorphic ears, as you see here, and pronounced genitalia, a nod to the ithyphallic satyrs pr pursuing nymphs portrayed in countless works of Greek art. Inspired by phallocrypts or penis sheaths known as koteca, worn for very various purposes, including decoration, ceremonial display, and or protecting or concealing the male member in certain highland ethnic groups in Papua New Guinea. Forming a complete picture on the stage floor, a la Matisse cutouts, that's why I had that image, when viewed from the raked house, the set will suggest a series of irregularly shaped pools dotting the landscape. Simpler but no less striking, these contemporary visual designs aim to reference the lavish pageantry of the Ballet Russe production in its heyday by a process of abstraction and distillation. In my version, Boeotians, inhabitants of Boeotia, a region in ancient Greece just north of Attica, with their shamans, the Bacantes, represent the human tribe to which Narcissus belongs. The role of Narcissus is dual, danced by Taylor Stanley and contemporary dancer Semyon Barber, as the youth and a physical incarnation of his reflection, respectively. While the role of the nymph Echo is presented on stage as an intersex character danced by a cisgender male struggling to exist outside the confines of their culture's gender binary. Characters labeled minor deities in Leon Bach's original design drawings are substituted with my own concept of a brotherhood of oreads or mountain nymphs in order to foreground an all-male corps de ballet representing other members of the supernatural tribe to which the nymph Echo belongs and the society in which they strive for acceptance. Interestingly, it appears that no poet or mythographer had combined the tale of Narcissus with his tragic suitor Echo, cursed to repeat only the last words spoken to her, before Ovid, Literally wasting away and fading into naught but a voice in thin air, she reads now as yet another spurned female character denied power by the norms of Greco-Roman culture. When the echo in my work is doubly spurned, first by their own supernatural tribesmen, and then by their newfound human lover, who ends up rejecting them in favor of his own image, rather than waste away by his side, they choose to seek their own path. And I'm going to show you now um, a little uh, bit of animation, rotoscoped animation and some uh, design illustrations that were turned into a little uh, film for, for New York Live Arts recently. And sorry. This kind of introduces all the characters, so. And, and shows some rotoscoped animations of the actual dancing. Okay. I'm going to just skip. Wait, there we go.
Okay. Oh wait, why is that still playing? Well, sorry guys. I, always, I think I have to stop it. Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. So the um, now uh, there is we, I I worked with the Oreads and with the Echo character when I was at uh, the Center for Belly in the Arts. So I'll show now just a little uh, clip of that material. Let's see.
sorry, I did it again. Okay, now this bit has a little bit of echo here. Let's see. Ah, you have to do this in a very specific order unless, I mean, otherwise it doesn't work. That's very clear now. Got it. Okay. So much for our tech rehearsals. <laughs> exactly. Well, that, that's my ineptness. It's nothing to do with your tech savvy, Terry. You were excellent. <laughs>
So I just have one more little thing here, and this is uh, uh, Narcissus's reflection, the amazing Simeon Barber.
So that's, that's what I have for you in terms of sharing from the pieces in progress. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Everyone can unmute and, um, and, yeah, and ask questions or comments. I did forget to tell everyone that we are recording this, so um, just to let you know the that it's just for archival purposes. Um, so I forgot to, to say that in the beginning. Um, does anyone want to start with a question? I can also put something in the chat and you can also go to participants and raise your hand or... Um, Lois? Christopher, just, I want to thank you for... Thank you for sharing so much material. Um, the vision of, of your work is so comprehensive and so rich and visual. Um, I'm curious how you see the three pieces. Uh, will they be three like standalone that are all experienced in one evening? Or, or is there a transition to connect them or how will it be structured? Thank you, Lois, it's a very good question. So. Um, just to be very clear, the afternoon of a fawn and Les Sophide were built to put on the Joyce Pride Festival program. So th those are the shorter pieces. There are th going to be three short pieces that make up the Joyce Pride program. Narcissus is a completely separate work. It's an evening length piece. And so you saw those, all those characters. So th it, it's a full evening length piece, whereas the others are shorter ballets. Thank you. You're welcome, yeah. Uh, Lisa had a question, Lisa Krause. Yeah, hi. Hi, Lisa, I love hi. Your, um, your birch background, birch forest yeah, background. It's in the birch forest. Very Russian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. It's so rich what you're working with. It's a, it's a gold mine, I think. Um, and, and so my question has to do with how you're mining it uh, because you know, my understanding is there's like precious little of any film of Nijinsky. I don't, I don't even know, but I know there are many, many photographs, but I'm just curious, um, you know, how much your choice of movement, I mean, shape wise, I can certainly see the relationship to images that I've seen, but I'm just wondering how you're channeling the information that you've taken from historical material. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Truly, an excellent question. Um, I don't believe uh, that there is any footage whatsoever of Nijinsky dancing. People have actually tried to animate photos to make little bastardized videos, but there, that's not anything of what uh, any footage at all. So you're absolutely correct in that. Um, to answer the second part of your question, um, I really have been, you know, I, I looked at all the images that I could find, I looked at all the design drawings, etc. And you know, that sensibility of some of the shape and some of the bodily architecture that you can glean from the photographs has definitely influenced the work as you noticed. That's it. You know, the only other influence I'm taking from the historical past is the music itself. So every step, every piece is choreographed directly to the music and my contemporary response in my idiom to that music. So I've been using historical recordings of these amazing scores that haven't seen the light of day in some cases like Narcissus in quite a while. And so it's all just drawn from the music. I create the steps in the studio by myself, responding to the music and envisioning the character that I or see in the scenario. So 
you know, I know that my echo is an intersex character, so their movement is different than the movement for Narcissus, but it's all drawn from the music because certain sections of the ballets are devoted towards certain uh, scenario elements. So, for example, um, Echo est abandonné, you know, Echo is abandoned is the title of one of them. So that deeply inspired my um, choreography for the Echo character in relationship to the score itself but no, not really to the old scenarios, just the musical scores, yeah. Yeah, that's visible too. I mean, oh, how, how closely you're working with every swell and every little punctuation in the music. It's very yes, it's something that I've been interested in doing for quite a while. And, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's a deep form of inspiration for me, actually. Mm -hmm. Because when I hear that music, I see steps to it. I can't help it. That's what happens. And so I try to bring them out and then translate them to other bodies. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you about the music too, because it, it's not predictable. So it, it seems like, you know, that that's part of it you, you've handled very, very well, especially the, those sections in that with the flying and the tossing of the of the people and bodies all over each other it was just really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, actually, Terry, it's interesting because I'm always a believer that, um, you know, if you're going to use music with dance, they can't compete on stage. They have to meet each other. Right. So it's my responsibility to meet the amazing power of that music in those extreme moments. So that, that drew out the choreography you saw of tossing and using mm -hmm. high level changes and um, more dangerous kind of elements, so to speak. Right. Um, yeah. And the way the character also walks on the backs of others and is manipulated. It's just, it's really wonderful. Right. Thank Another you. question from Lynn. She says, are you trying to develop a specific distinct movement vocabularies for each work? What do you start with as movement seeds and how much do the dancers contribute? I'll go in reverse order. The dancers usually contribute zero. However, I must say, that you know, when I teach the material, they'll interpret it in a way that I will then change it to fit their bodies often. So I always make the steps. I don't know why, but I'm a really old school choreographer in that way. I have to make everything myself on my own body. And so the dancers don't contribute really. Um, other than that in, in their interpretation, things sometimes morph in a beautiful way that I could never have imagined on my own. Uh, Terry, repeat the, the, the two okay. other parts. The seeds so, and then what was the, the other one? Seeds of the movement and, yep. and how much your dancers contribute. You tr are you trying to develop, so you're working backwards here. Are you trying to develop specific, distinct movement vocabularies for each work? Yeah, okay. That is a really interesting question. Something that I have been struggling with for a long time. Because I make every step myself, I fear that my works will look very similar you know, that they will have a vocabulary that is not uh, expansive enough. And, you know, in my early days, there were critics who did mention that that was happening and or they said that my work wasn't dancey enough at one point. They said it looked like good old tableau vivant, which, of course, I absolutely love. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, I got really incensed and I took that as a deep challenge. So I've been trying to really craft every step with great depth since that comment was put into the press. And, um, you know, I, I do, I do treat it specifically towards each piece, you know, each movement vocabulary world for each piece is its own thing. But I guess the audience must be the judge of whether that's reading, because I'm not certain. I just, you know, when I, when I make movement to the music, uh, I often just make it so intuitively and I can't really see anything else that would fit to that moment because I saw it in my mind that way. So, you know, that is potentially a deep foible in my work. And I'd love to know if anyone agrees that, you know, it's all too similar or not. Um, but because of course I have my signature uh, style and, you know, I think Janet Charleston is with us. She can probably attest to the fact that, you know, there are certain things in a Christopher Williams work that just are there in every piece. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. And then the seeds. Um, the, re repeat what you wanted to know about the seeds, please. Sorry, my. 
<laughs> what do you start with as movement seeds? It seems to me yeah. you, you have a balletic penchant and these are ballets, historically balletic. So it, it's an interesting kind of, uh, you know, um, what hybrid maybe? I don't know. What, yeah. what do you think? But that's what's the second question. Thank you, very much appreciated. So yes, um, you know, I, I have a background. I studied ballet when I was very young. Then I stopped because I was teased as a boy. And then I went back to dance in college and studied under Viola Farber. And I studied at the Merce Cunningham Dance Studio. So there is this deeply uh, formal element to my choreography and it's deeply influenced, I would say, by Cunningham and the availability of positions of the torso. Now, the thing that I've added to T Cunningham's world, so to speak, is the idea of spiral. So whereas Cunningham uses a lot of curve, tilt, twist, and arch, I also add spiral in mine as an option. And then I, you know, use that and I create it uh, as either in concert with or in contrast to the legs that have all their options in the balletic world, so to speak. Yes. So, Yes, it's very, uh, it's very balletic in a sense in that it's technically challenging in terms of the formalist shapes I'm interested in, but I'm always interested in how those uh, shapes move from one to the other in relation to the music. And that's, I think, where my unique style comes in. And the seeds for the movement are always born from that music. I'm inspired to move by the music and I use my torso or an, and or legs and or head to express that. Yeah, but... I just, I just, uh... Go ahead, Michael. We have two more questions after that. Go ahead. I want to, not as a question, but to thank you for the fearless querying of the stories you're telling, because I think within the dance community, there's a lot of male dance happening. But you are cutting through to a place that's very intimate, and very needed in the world within our community. So I just want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you. That's just- Yeah, ditto. So, so moving to me to hear, because, you know, I, I really haven't seen a lot of, uh, let's say, you know, lyrical, soft, um, romantic movement for men in a very long time. And that's, I'm not right in saying that it doesn't exist because other choreographers are starting to do it. They're starting to pierce through, as you say. Um, but I'm just on a crusade to, to make this movement for men that is just incredibly romantic for some reason, you know, and, and beautiful. I care deeply about beauty and I care about um, fluidity between the genders, basically. So yeah. thank you, Dan. It's not, yes. just, it's not just a um, kind of cutout of what that is what male relationship is, but I just feel there's the heart of it is there. So it's um, a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. I think you've answered a question that someone else had about um, Keith, about um, the movement reflecting a gay lens and that you're using for an overall structure of your work. So I think that very much answers that um, directly. Of course, I, yeah, I, sorry, you add to that, that? you can add that. Well, there's a, there's a question from Jim S. Yeah, I was going to just okay. say that. Yeah, Great. yeah. Jim um, Shelley says, how, how did the costumes come to fruition? Any specific influences? Yeah, and, and that is something that's so important to mention. You know, I mentioned this kind of Gesamtkunstwerk kind of uh, bent of mine and all works of art operating together, just like in the Ballet Russe era. I mean, it was inc an incredible time. I wish I could just travel back in time and experience what, what, what that was like somehow. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I've been collaborating for over 10 years with Andrew Jordan, an amazing visual designer. And what happens in our process is that I will come up with an idea of something that I want something to look like, and then he will grapple with it and fight me on it and or agree and do some kind of uh, nuts and bolts figuring out of how we could achieve something. And we always arrive at a third entity beyond whether, what either of us had ever expected. So an example, let me think of a good example. Um, yes, an example is the, uh, the Oread costumes. So I said, I want these Oreads to 
look naked. And I want them to have skins that are different than human skins. And so Andrew said, oh, great. Well, you know, that's impossible. The only way we can do that with a, is with a unitard, old hat, right? And I said, well, what if we don't use the full unitard? And, you know, what if we continue with this printing on the fabric idea? So that's how we came up with the printed skins. And they kind of wear partial unitards mm -hmm. just to cover enough of them to give them a sense of skin that is not a human skin, but enough human skin showing to represent them as naked creatures. So that's just a small example of how we arrive at something that uh, you know, neither of us actually expected. Um, and of course, you know, we, we loved the uh, little nod to the assless chaps kind of element in gay culture <laughs> for the Oriad characters. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's many, many, many uh, tendrils growing together to arrive at something uh, over time in the costume design. And it's, it's hugely thanks to Andrew Jordan and his genius. Yeah. Truly. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask Chris, uh, Christopher, um, in Afternoon of a Fawn, I wondered if you could speak a little more about the ending, the dark ending that you chose. Because I, when I saw that, it, it, it created a lot of sadness in me. I kind of flashed to, to um, kind of this cultural stereotype that where if you, if, if, if men are in love, that there has to be kind of sadness or sickness or death or some sort of tragedy um, mm -hmm. as, a, as the balance to that. So I, I was just curious on what your thinking was about that. Wow, thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very powerful observation. I appreciate that. And I do see how it can read that way for sure. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of ancient history. So I, in making that ending, I know that nymphs are all based on ancient tutelary goddesses who were protectors of sacred springs, for example, and they always demanded human sacrifice. So you know, the Menads in ancient Greece, they devoured Orpheus. You know, they tore him apart and put his remains in the, in the heavens. The, um, you know, all sorts of nymphs out there. Um, Hylas was dragged to the depths of the spring by the nymphs and lost to his lover Hercules. So um, for me, it's actually a ritual sacrifice is what's going on there and not so much a squelching of the gay male love affair. It, and you see that the chief of the nymphs is weeping at the end. So the, I, I tried to show the gruesome nature of the ritual sacrifice with the deep remorse of the loving chief of the nymphs, who in this case, you know, is sad to see the victim be consumed, for example. So yes, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. And I'm always wondering about that myself. You know, a lot of film, contemporary film, has, you know, terrible tragedy occur to the gay characters. It's just like par for the course for some reason. And you're right, we need to start um, creating a scenario where there's much more positivity. But by the same token, I can't really escape these ancient tropes that are involved in these particular pieces, which is why I stuck to that kind of uh, gruesome ritual sacrifice idea from the nymphs. And it really does come from their ancient source um, demanding ritual sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And doesn't that happen in the ballet as well? I mean, isn't, isn't that one of the, the character? I don't know which one it is. Is it the Le Sylphide or is it the, the lover that, the human lover that gets, that, and that ends, that dies or that perishes for that? Well, well, Le Sylphide has no, no real narrative. Okay. Um, you might be thinking of other ballets in the romantic canon out there, okay. but All right. yeah. but yeah, I mean, it often happens, you know, that, that I, I also happen to be a fan of tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I recognize uh, you know, that it's important to uh, speak to and address uh, the standardization of tragedy for the, you know, LGBT QA plus community, and we need to definitely make some positive steps there, so. We have a question from Josie. 
<clears throat> what an opportunity for the interlochen students. Can you talk about the process of working with them? Yeah, okay, so first of all, those are high school kids that you saw performing that piece. Unbelievable. I mean, they, they were better than some college students I've worked with over time, you know? So Interlochen is incredible. You know, they have the resources to bring in choreographers and spend a month working with these students mm -hmm. to create a piece. And, you know, I worked with them every day, pretty much, and taught them their parts and then developed the choreography with them in the room, you know, all of the elements. Because, of course, I make steps, but to make a piece, you have to have the dancers with working with you and arrange them in space and um, get ideas from their relationships with one another. And they were all completely open to this idea, gung-ho, tired as hell from all of their schoolwork, but showed up to every rehearsal with positive energy and just a complete kind of excitement about this because they knew they were participating in something that had a historical thread that was being updated in the contemporary here and now. And that felt exciting for them, you know, and the bravery of those two boys who played the chief of the nymphs and the fawn. I mean, one of them was actually heterosexual and the other turned out to come out much later after he left Interlochen. But I remember having a conversation with them and Jacob said to me, you know, Christopher, I'm not gay. And I said, Jacob, that's okay. You're dancing a role. And he, his eyes opened up wide, like, wow, I could actually be playing a role that's not myself in dance. And do, you know, so this realization for him was extraordinary. And then he just melted into acceptance completely and got really into it. And, you know, their friendship between those two dancers is lasting to this day. And, you know, I, it's just beautiful. I mean, they, they fell in love in a way that had nothing to do with their sexualities. And it was just from doing the piece together. So I, I found that process to be incredibly beautiful and incredibly rewarding. And, you know, I, I, I would work with any of those kids to this day. I mean, I hope they graduate and come to New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More questions, more comments. Well, as usual, Christopher, this was chock full. Yeah, I know, easy. probably too long. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's wonderful. No, great. No, totally a treat. And um, thank you, everyone, for um, everybody here. for. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Thank you. You're inspiring, Christopher. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank <laughs> Maybe we can bring some of that to Philly, you know, when it's yes. when it's completed. Sure so, hope so. Yeah, sure hope so. You, I, come see it in New York in 21 yeah. or 22 sure. if it happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just have to tell everyone that our our final um, concluding informants is December 2nd with Amalia Kolanava. She's going to screen some of her films and she's an emerging filmmaker and dance artist here in Philly. She, we had, she was going to show work in March, which of course was canceled. So we're happy to be able to give her the opportunity in December. And um, if you saw Gia Corliss uh, writing in today's paper, I just wanted to leave you with this thought. She said um, that for those in the dance world, um, we know that while the pandemic will continue to prevent public performances for what now looks to be another year or so, dance is still alive in the world. It's making headlines with dancing in the streets. As much as what it looks, it's making headlines as much for what it looks like as what it feels like. Dancing is not just about moving your body, but reclaiming it. And with that, your faith in the world. And I think that very much fits with Christopher's sensibilities. So anyway, thank you all very, very much. And Christopher. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a thank great you. night. Good night. Good night. Thanks.